Hello and welcome to Graphics Wizardry with me, Phil. We're going to be going through um, some really cool rendering techniques today to make your drawings look a little bit less crap. This is a drawing I did a while ago, just a, a actually a very small sketch on a piece of paper of a hard drive or something in my Crap Gadget series. And I'm going to be going through a, a series of techniques today that will help you take something that looks a little bit like this, which has got a lot of particularly ropey pieces of um, art on it, and to transform this into something which is extremely precise and which looks really, really cool. So I'm going to do this in a couple of different sessions. So we'll probably do the first one is going to be going through and doing masking and airbrushing. And then the second section, we'll um, peel that off into a different video and we'll talk about using photographic textures and applying textures and maybe putting your artwork into uh, a sort of contextual environment so that it looks really good. Trust me, by the end of this process, this hard drive will look great. In fact, you could probably see what it looks like because the um, a version of this hard drive is the um, graphic up at the top of this um, YouTube channel. So I feel like I've kind of spoiled the surprise by doing that, but um, bear with me and hopefully we'll um, have some kind of a, a journey through Photoshop together that we'll all find beneficial. So I, I've previously tidied this um, drawing up, but as ever, we would do the exact same thing that we do with everything, which is to desaturate the artwork and then use a levels adjustment layer to make sure that all the blacks are black and all the whites are white. It looks pretty fine now. I'm satisfied that everything's okay with it. And um, uh, like I said, that this drawing was originally not intended to be viewed at a sort of ginormous close-up. Um, zoom factor. So it's got my unique scribbly drawing style. Um, why use just one line when you can use four or five? Um, this is something that a lot of people do when they're drawing, kind of because um, what happens is you maybe it takes a few goes to get the uh, general sort of feeling of the outline of the shape, but when a viewer looks at it, their eye perceive the gestalt of the line, so rather than just seeing each individual line, they sort of perceive that it's a generalised line, and this little crappy curve here is sort of represents an idealised curve. So sort of in amongst these scribbly lines, there is a perfect curve, and uh, normally, um, when somebody sees a crappy picture like this, their brain produces and perceives that idealised curve, so they just understand that that's a general curve, rather than actually thinking that this object is this shape because no one would ever build an object that shape but the standard of rendering that we're going to be doing today means we're going to have to push past this um, low level of accuracy and we're going to produce that idealized curve we're going to remove the ambiguity from people who are looking at it and we're going to produce a piece of artwork which has got that idealized curve on it and the way we're going to do this is by using um, paths to do the masking so if you go if you can't see your paths click paths, window paths, and you get this little palette just here. By default, I think it docks next to the layers palette just here, but we need to be able to see both of them simultaneously. So I'm just gonna click on the paths. I can pull the palette out just here, but in fact, where I want it to be is I want it to dock down here at the bottom of the palette here. So now I'll be able to see the um, layers because we're gonna have a whole bunch of layers and the paths just here. I'm gonna try and keep the paths organized. Now there's a particular thing about paths that is um, irritating to me that Photoshop does. I, I get why it does it, but it's not particularly useful for what we're gonna do. So I want you guys, if you're gonna go through this, to try and keep an eye on how Photoshop handles this. Basically, we're gonna be using the pen tool. So if you click P on your keyboard, and it's this um, little fountain pen just here, the way fountain pen works, the pen tool works, is that it drops down points that it, Photoshop joins up with either straight lines or bezier curves, which can be weighted using a handle like this. And these appear down here as a work path. Now, if you only let Photoshop keep working in a work path, what Photoshop does is once we get rid of this or start working on something else, if we want to come back to it later on, because it's just a temporary thing, Photoshop assumes we don't need it anymore and it trashes it, which means that if we have been precise and produced a really nice mask that we need to be able to come back to later on, we've lost it. So what we're going to do is, um, let me just kill this. 
I'm going to make a new path set and I'm going to call it hard drive. This path set is kind of like a layer, but the, the way that paths work is we're, it's not, we're not putting pixel data down onto the artboard. We're not changing anything light or dark. The paths kind of exist in a sort of parallel universe to layers. So until we specifically tell Photoshop what we want to do with these paths, um, it does nothing. They, they won't affect this. So if it prints, you won't be able to see them. If you export it to the web, you won't be able to see them. They just exist here in this, um, in this artwork space. So I've made a path set down here called hard drive. I've got my pen tool here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a path that traces the outline of this top surface here. So we can imagine that this is one continuous surface. I'm going to make a path that makes this top outline so that we can make a mask of this top surface and then apply some color to that. We're also going to mask out this beveled curve just here. We're going to mask out this front here. And then I'm going to show you guys how to use uh, like a, a really nice airbrushing technique to make these curves here look really smooth and to make this drawing pop. But first of all, you've got to get your head around exactly how these um, pen tool paths work. So what I'm going to do is I'm just sort of click just here, just before this curve here, and then I'm going to click after the curve. I'm going to hold down the mouse button and drag, and you can see that it, it what I call biases the curve, it weights the curve using this handle here. So I'm going to move over here and click again. So you see what happens here is we get a straight line, a, a, an exactly straight line between the two. What I'm going to do now is click after this curve, click and drag until I think it's about right. And then again, exactly the same thing down here, click and then click and drag. Click, click and drag. And see what I'm doing here is that I'm visualizing what the idealized curve is in between all of these live lines. So there, click. And then as I hover over this point, this is the first point that I put down right at the beginning. You look at the pen tool like that. When I move over that point there, you'll see a little circle appears next to it. What that means is that I'm closing that curve. Okay, if I didn't close this curve, then um, when I convert this to uh, selection, what Photoshop does is it draws a straight line from the last dropped point to the first drop point. And that I've seen that catch a few people out. So what we try and do is, for, for these projects that we're doing now, try and close the curves. That way you retain control over exactly how it works. Okay, so um, now you can see that's what we've just done. That This path here has been selected. I'll just explain a little bit about how paths work. So we've got this um, set of tools just here, the pen tool, freeform pen tool, which is kind of like um, a, pa a paintbrush or something you can sort of scribble and draw with, which is not precise enough for what we want. Add anchor point tool does exactly what it sounds like. If I was to select this and click in the middle of one of these lines, just here, we simply add an anchor point in. Delete anchor point, you're one step ahead of me. Click, bye. Okay, the next thing that we need to look at is the selection tools. Now this, this is one of the selection tools here. It's the uh, path selection tool and the direct selection tool. And the path selection tool, if you look at all of these points now, they're solid. If I click off and then click back on, I can click and select the whole shape. And if I click and drag, you see that it moves the entire shape all in one go as though it were a single thing. Now, if I click the direct selection tool, click off and then click back on to select, you notice that each of these, these anchor points now is hollow. And when I select one of them, now I can move that individual point around or I can adjust the curves. So when you're doing if you're going to go through and follow this project along, when you're building your shapes like this using the pen tool, you don't have to be, it's not necessarily just the first pass is the correct one. You can always go in and adjust things later on. And you select the um, selection tools, the path selection tools, by clicking A on the keyboard, and you switch between them by clicking Shift A. So I've got the direct selection tool here. If I want the path selection tool, click Shift and A, and now I can select everything all at once. This is what I want now. I'm going to make a new layer. I'm going to drag it underneath the pens. Now make sure pens is set to multiply every single session, every session, every single damn session. Someone forgets how to do this. Multiply. 
you should write it on a post-it note, fold the top over so that the sticky side is on the side with the text, and then stick it to your forehead whilst you're using Photoshop, and that way, at least one of your eyes will be obscured by a little note which says, set pens to multiply, okay? Make it harder to forget that way. So I'm gonna call this layer here, top surface, And you can see that I've still got this uh, selected. I'm not clicking here. If it's like this, it's not selected. It needs to be selected like this. I'm gonna set the foreground color to 50% gray. If you remember, I've selected grayscale slider from just here. And what I did now was just click this button down at the bottom. It says fill path with foreground color. There's a whole load of different ways to do this. Um, sort of an introductory way is to click this one here, which sets it to a selection. That's super useful, and it also gets your head into the space of understanding about exactly how you're converting these pens into um, a selection like this that you can use to control the artwork. And it also ties in with the way that we're, we've been working so far in terms of making selections. But um, that's not what I'm gonna do now. So we've now got this shape. And that's the top surface. The next thing I'm going to do is make a set of paths that describes this curve just here. And I'm going to make sure, make sure that I've got a hard drive selected now. Because if I start drawing with a pen tool now without selecting this, it will simply put the points and the path onto a work, um, work path. If it does that, it's not the end of the world. Just double click on where it says work path on the paths palette just here and you'll be able to rename that set. And a named set is will endure, so you'll be able to make sure that you retain that. Okay, I'm just gonna reduce down the opacity of the pens layer now, so that I can definitely um, see exactly where the breakpoints for all of these shapes are. Make sure that I've got the hard drive path selected. I'm just gonna click here, and start building the shapes again. And you see, again, this is a really sort of messy corner that I've drawn very untidily, uh, but I'm able to go through and add in the accuracy that was missing in the original drawing. So what I'm doing really is using this underdrawing kind of as a, a, a guide rather than sort of a canonical, you know, this is the definite shape that it must be. It's just sort of inspiring me to know what my intent was when I was doing the design work. Now what I could do is I could go through and follow this forward for, um, front curve here really precisely using the, the pen tool, but I'm not gonna do that because that's taken care of by this layer with the artwork on it. So what I'm gonna do is just click here and here so that we've now closed that curve. I'm just going to make sure that everything's okay with this. It looks like the perspective's a bit shot, actually, on the um, points just here. So I'm going to nudge that up using the cursor key and pull this down slightly using the cursor key. Yeah, that looks like it's okay now. I'm going to set a slightly different colour here, mainly so that we can tell which layer is on top of which. Make a new layer underneath everything else called bevel. And again, click this fill path with foreground color button just here. So we've got these two shapes, and this is what I meant about not needing to worry about this front curve here because it's taken care of by the top surface. You'll notice that because I've got this hard drive path set selected here, all of these lines are still vis visible. If you just wanna visualize what the artwork looks like without them, just click off this hard drive path set just here on the path palette. So now I can see what it is. I can always just click back on it again and get back onto it there, which is what I'm gonna do now because I'm gonna draw in this bottom shape here. So making sure that I've got the hard drive path set selected.
Okay, close enough. And again, I'm just going to join the points up across the middle of the shape here. Again, pick a slightly darker colour. I'm going to make a new layer underneath everything else called front surface and hit the fill path with foreground colour button. So now you can see we've got all three of the main surfaces defined using the um, path tool. So I'm just actually super quickly just going to go through and um, the this sort of set of fins just here. I'm going to pick up in two separate pieces. I'm going to make a new um, path setting just here called fins. Perspective on this isn't perfect, but um, it turns out I don't really care. And again, just pick a darker colour. I'm going to make a new layer here called underneath everything else called fins. So what I'm doing here is you notice that the colours for this aren't particularly important to me. My main concern is just making sure that I've got the masks for everything sorted out. Um, yeah, it looks fine. Click on fins again because that's the section where I want these lines to go down. What I'm going to do now is just draw this shape just here. Now, we'll get into this situation here, if you've been following along so far. This handle that I've got hold of now, if I release that, I need to go basically back up here. If I do that, you'll notice that it biases the curve after the point, and I could try and fudge it, but that's slightly inconvenient. What I'm going to do is, as I put this point down, drag the line so that it shapes the curve just immediately preceding it, then when I'm satisfied that the curve is behind behind the anchor point is fine, I'm going to hold down Alt on the keyboard and drag this point over here. You notice that it doesn't affect the original point now. So I kind of want it just to point up in the direction we're going to go, which is up here. And now I can also grab this rather than I've actually put that point down, hold down Alt and drag that point just to there. So I've got this shape exactly the way I want it to be. So I'm not going to kill myself on getting these exactly right. Just need to be more or less sort of suggested whereabouts they are. Excellent. Now, here's the cool thing about this, is because I've got these all um, all done, one, two, I hold down shift and pick up the other selections, three, four, five, I'm going to just add a new layer in here, fins front, lighten this up, and so long as I've got all of those selected, click this button here and you'll see that it fills all of them with the uh, foreground colour. So. The bulk of the artwork, in terms of making the masks, is correct. And what we're going to do now is use a kind of airbrush technique. Now, what I could do is go in and show you how to use gradients. So gradients are fine for some things, but they're actually a quite an inorganic way of working. And if you've been following along so far, I kind of like the um, more sort of analog way of producing artwork using Photoshop. We can still retain a lot of precision. As you can see now, we've got something that looks a lot more precise than our original sketch. But we don't need to lose this sense of freedom that we've got with the original sketching. And sometimes using gradients can add in a certain rigidity. Um, if not in the final result, then certainly in the way of working. So I'm going to work in a slightly different way. What I'm going to do is um, just click B on the keyboard to get the brush tool up. And what I'm going to use is a really, really big, very soft brush. If you remember correctly, then you can press Control and Alt on your keyboard 
on a PC, use the right mouse button. On the Mac, use the left mouse button. Left and right is small to large, up and down, soft to hard. So I'm going to go to a really big brush um, that is 0% hardness. And for the opacity, I'm going to pick, say, 20%. And remember, you can set the opacity rather than having to go in and do all of this sliding from left to right. It's really old-fashioned way of working. You just click one of the number keys on the keyboard, 5 to 50%, 2 to 20%. Um, 36 to 36%, usually just switch between 10% 10, uh, 10 increments like that. So what I'm going to do is grab a dark colour and I'm going to use this airbrush to create a gradient across the top surface here. To avoid spillage of the paint, what I'm going to do is lock the transparency. And you do that by clicking on the layer that you want to work on, click lock transparency here, so okay, so let me just do a double check before I put any paint down. I've got a massive brush. It's got 0% hardness, 20% opacity. And what I could do is just click, drag, 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 click, drag, 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 like this. But I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is to click just here, which is completely off the artwork. Hold down Shift on the keyboard and click over here. And what that does is it draws a straight line using the brush that we've just selected from the first point to the second point. And now if I click Shift and click back over here and back, and back, it sort of bounces backwards and forwards. So it's almost like doing these very gentle sprays with an airbrush, which is how airbrush artists work, I am told. So I've put a bit of darkness in the background. I want the foreground to pick up. So you see you've got this big contrast between the background and the foreground. And this, you notice, does not go outside of the boundaries of the uh, shape that we've already set because of this pixel lock okay and it's this button here we're not it, some people in the sessions have gone through click this button here what that means is you can't do anything with that layer that literally locks the layer and um, we're not going to do this that means you can't move it around I think I'll never use that it's this one it's the transparency lock that's the one you have to hit and you can recognize it because this uh, little icon is supposed to be the transparency grid from the background in the um, artboard here so that's that top surface there. It looks like it's got a bit of um, foreshortening and it's got a bit of depth to it, indicating, say, the light's coming down here, the surface is catching it, and we're going to get a bit of contrast between the front and the back. Fine, happy with that. Brilliant. So now we're going to work on the bevel here, and I just need to click on the lock transparency button here. Now, this one's slightly different because it's not going to be a straight gradient like this, and this is where we start reaping the benefits of using this particular tool set rather than a standard gradient, because you could just have, that could just be a gradient. I could have wasted my time doing that. Um, so what I'm going to do is pick a, a light colour here. We're still on 20% opacity, slightly smaller brush. And I'm going to pick out this front just here, because this is where the light's going to be catching. If the light's coming down from up here, there's a, I'm imagining the sun is up here, light shining down. This section here might be slightly more in darkness. We might get a return shadow from a uh, return highlight from sort of the environment reflecting some light just here and similarly just here. So you notice that I'm not picking and staying with just one particular sort of brush set. I'm trying to be flexible in terms of the way that I'm putting the ink down on the surface. Uh, that's fine, it doesn't need to be overly detailed. We're just trying to communicate that there is this curve down here. So I'm going to set the front surface. Now, every single one of these needs to have this transparency lock put on it. So this is going to have light just here. Um, and perhaps this side just here is going to be slightly darker. So let's just pop a bit of the darkness in. This is where this particular tool shines, is because we can do this nice vertical highlight just here by clicking here, one, click down, hold down shift, two, just there. And we can retain the perspective of the object in a way that is slightly more challenging using the um, gradients tool. And I know that the Photoshop wizards who are looking at this will know that we could draw a gradient across there and use um, the distort tool to conform it to the perspective that we need. But I quite like this sort of very, like I said, this organic way of working. So 
I'm actually going to drop a bit of white in just here. Very large, dark brush. Okay, looking good. A couple of little bits that I need to do down here just on the fins. I'm going to put a small brush with a very dark colour on it just across here a couple of times. Uh, you see, look, that's what I did. I forgot to put the um, transparency lock on. If you notice that there starts being a bit of um, noise across here, and that's a bit of a trick because I probably wouldn't notice that. But what we're going to do later with um, textures, that screws us up. So, like, there you go, well spotted. Let me just switch the transparency on. And whilst I'm here, might as well switch it on for that as well. Right, so let's do a couple of passes here. And for these fins, I just want to indicate that they're sort of under this surface rather than joining directly onto them. I think that this, if it's sitting on, say, uh, like a white or reflective table, then we might pick up a bit of return highlight from here. So there we go. Cool. So I'm satisfied that we've got a bit of depth now to this. Um, I have managed to spill a little bit just there. Let's just deselect this. perilous this right of course cool. so there's a couple of more details that have been neglected this shut line just here if you can imagine this is one half one half both of which have been bolded and then clicked together in some minimum wage hellhole in Chengdu or something in China which is how all electronic gadgets are made and you should be ashamed of yourself for designing them this shut line here is going to be an important part in communicating to people who look at your sketch to understand some part of the sort of manufacture and assembly process. And again, things like this communicate some of the reality of what you're working on. So I'm going to make a new layer up on top called shut line. And I'm going to click on this hard drives again because we're actually going to do this using paths. So click P. Click P, actual P. There we go. And I'm going to do is to click one. Let's get nice and close so I don't get it wrong. Two, three, four. Kushti, so now all I need to do is to make sure that that is the only part that's selected. I've got my shut line layer selected. Now what I'm going to do is prep a brush. So I'm going to go 100% black, 100% opacity, click zero on the keyboard, 100% opacity. And I need a teeny tiny three point brush that is 100% hard. So all the way down, and I can just, there we go, three points. Wonderful. So we'll take this top line off so you can see exactly what this is gonna do. I've got hard drive selected, I've got this line selected here. Rather than clicking this here, which is the fills that we pressed earlier on, stroke path with brush. By clicking on this button, it basically runs the brush that we've just made along this line like this. So now this is that sort of mathematically perfect shut line. And what I'm going to do is to click Alt on the keyboard and drag it away. Because I need basically a dark line and a highlight to indicate that there's a sort of very, very narrow cavity between the two. Now this is pure black. If you click Control i on the keyboard, it will invert the colour to pure white. And I'm just going to assemble it into the right sort of place so that it's going to be in direct contact with the black line. You see, when I duplicate it, it makes a new layer just here. I'm going to pop that underneath because I want the black line to be in front and not to be completely dominated by the white line. I'm going to flatten the two down together. Let's just call it shut line, so not shut line copy. And set the transparency mode to overlay. And that makes it slightly more sensitive to the darkness and colour of the uh, shapes underneath. And reduce the opacity slightly. And you, this isn't a right or wrong, you just have to tweak it until you're satisfied that it's exactly the way that you want it to be. 
And in fact, you see that it pulls over the edge slightly just here. So what I'm going to do is to select a little area like this and click delete. But what I'm also going to do is to go down to the front surface, unlock the transparency and delete that edge out of that as well. So you see now that the shape has got a little tiny notch in the side and now the silhouette as well as the light and dark on the front surface of it support this you know the story that's told by this um, this line. I'm going to do the same thing up here just a little nick in like this delete that from the shut line then click the top surface unlock the transparency and pop it out from there. So that all looks great wonderful shut lines more or less in place now this little surface here this is a kind of it's almost like a countersunk LED the way to do this and make a new layer everything's all organized on layers light recess I'm going to use this elliptical marquee tool hold down alt when you draw it if you just draw it like this it doesn't really matter if you get it wrong at this point because we're going to rejigging everything around in a second anyway but if you hold down alt when you draw with a box or a marquee tool or a circle or anything like this also in illustrator as well as in photoshop it draws it from the center so i'm going to get it as reasonably it doesn't matter it makes no difference whatsoever if you're even remotely close with this because of what we're about to do set this to a lighter color um, with a foreground color hold down alt and backspace to fill that shape what I'm going to do is click Control and T, which is the free transform tool, and I'm just going to jig this about until it's in more or less the right sort of place. It's kind of difficult to see actually with this, so I'm going to just reduce the opacity of the pens line. Control T to get back into that. Nope, that's Control R, which shows and hides the rulers. Control T. I'm working in a dark room and I can barely see my keyboard, I'm afraid. So you have to forgive me for any key errors that you may spot. Here we go. Let me just get this. What I'm trying to do with this is to make sure that the outline of the ellipse that I'm working with is hidden by the outline of the ellipse that was drawn when I originally made this shape. But let me just check. I could make sure that the um, perspective is right because obviously the key axis of this ellipse is going to be in line with the vanishing point. Uh, there we go, that'll do. Of course, I'm happy with that. Wonderful. Lock that in by pressing return on the keyboard. Now, by grabbing the a brush tool, I'm going to switch back to having a large soft brush. And I'm going to reduce the opacity and lock the transparency of that layer. I switch to a dark colour. A couple of passes should be enough to define the sort of recessed shape because if you remember this is a almost like a sort of countersunk shape just a sort of almost like a sphere highlight just here you can see that that's got a bit of sculptural depth now I'm going to duplicate this layer by clicking and dragging it down to the new layer button at the bottom that duplicates this light recess copy. So we've got two of these now in exactly the same spot. Undo that, that's back into place. I'm going to use Control and T to free transform that shape to a smaller shape again. I'm going to select white. This is the light that's going to sit inside the recess. So I've just dragged it backwards to the right place. And now you can see that that's got the feel of being a light hidden within that sort of cavity. Um, we'll give that some colour and make it pop out a little bit more when we add some textures onto this. But we've gone, well, a gassed on for five minutes at the beginning. So again, half an hour from um, this shaky looking initial sketch, which itself only took maybe 10 minutes, to this, which has got a lot more physical presence on the page and a lot more depth. If we spent a bit longer on it, maybe we could have got it looking a little bit more tidy. And it looks like actually there might be some problems with the perspective if we want to be really finicky about it, but it certainly does a better job of communicating what shape the object is than the, any of the um, scribbly lines of the original drawing. So I'm going to leave this now as this. We're going to wrap this video up 
and I guess I'll see you on the other video which is going to be somewhere else on the page and you can see what it looks like with some textures on it and um, some shadows around the outside and I'll show you my ways of doing both of those things so uh, if you click in a minute I'll see you I'll see you then bye